I'm Jenny Robertson, founder of the On Purpose Woman Global Community and founder and publisher of On Purpose Woman Magazine. I'm here with Lindsay Pope to talk about her article in the November-December issue of On Purpose Woman Magazine. But Lindsay, before we have that conversation, welcome. Thank you for being with me. And what do you want our viewers to know about you? Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me. I My name is Lindsay. I uh, live here in Havre Grace, Maryland. Very blessed for that. And I am a writer. Uh, I have currently six books. Um, I'm hoping that that number will continue to grow because it's become a little bit of an addiction for me in a good way. Yeah. Um, and I also am a facilitator. Uh, I have uh, my master's degree in training and development. I worked professionally in the field for about 14 years. Uh, something I love to do is just combine facilitation with my interest in mental health and also writing to create classes and facilitate those. So it's been a lot of fun. Nice. Well, your article is called Surviving a Dark Night of the Soul. So first, first, thank you for sharing your journey in such a courageous way. And I really know that this will inspire some people and help them to be seen and heard and maybe not so alone. So I, I really thank you for doing that. Let's start though with, how do you define a dark night of the soul? That's a great question. Um, I think for me, when I heard that term, I actually heard it after I went through this experience and I thought it was Michael Bernard Beckwith was speaking about this. And when I heard him speaking about it, it was for me that moment of like, oh, you know, that's what I went through. Uh, now, when I was in it, I wouldn't have even known what to call that besides probably some horrible words because it's a horrible experience to go through. Um, but when I heard him or not do as good of a job as he did, but essentially how I would describe it is just this all encompassing, you're feeling this darkness within you and within your soul and you don't necessarily see the way out. You're kind of just trapped in this very scary mental space. Um, and it almost feels like you're in a prison, but you're actually, you're not really in prison, but you're just within your own mind, if that makes sense. So it's kind of hard to find a way out of it. So what was, you obviously found your way out of it, but before you started through that process, what was actually going on for you? You know, uh, do you know what, did anything cause it? Was there a, was there an event, a specific like triggering event, or was it just it's come out of nowhere? Had it been building for a while. Uh, tell us that a little bit of the background. Yes, for me, it had been building for a while. So I have suffered from anxiety for as long as to my very earliest childhood memories that I had very intense anxiety. I've also always been a highly sensitive person. Uh, which when I was growing up, nobody was speaking about that. Luckily, people now are much more open about it. So as an adult, I've come to learn a lot more about myself and be able to understand what it's like to be me. But as a child, I had absolutely no idea. So I was just experiencing all these things and I felt completely lost. Now, when this happened, um, that's what made it so interesting for me because I am a very logical person. I'm an intelligent person. So there was no defining thing that happened. There was no tragedy in my life that sort of spiraled me down to this. It was sort of like this building effect of just this anxiety that was becoming more and more encompassing. And what happened for me was that my anxiety was really the first thing that kind of grew, 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 grew. And it eventually became so powerful that the depression sort of kicked in. Because what happens for me is that my anxiety comes online and it tells me you can't do anything. You can't talk to anybody. And the more you isolate yourself and the more you're really not yourself, that gives that depression side a chance to kind of come online and start kind of coming at you from the other side. Like, oh my gosh, what a pathetic person you are. And it just, the thoughts kind of progress more and more downward into a spiral. Um, now for me, it started with, the thoughts were initially, you know, I don't want to be here. This is too hard. I can't live like this. And it was sort of like a passive. It was a passive sort of way of saying, you know, I, I don't, I'm not happy in this life. I need a way out. But I didn't necessarily want to ever harm myself. I'm very fortunate that that desire was not there. So for me, it was more like, okay, if I'm driving and somebody else hits my car and kills me, I'm okay with that. It was sort of like a, I'm okay with somebody else 
mm. doing, taking me away from this life. That's kind of how it started. And that didn't even really flag me as much as it should have. I unfortunately got to a pretty bad point before I was finally like, you know, this isn't right. And maybe I should get help. Um, so when I talk about it now, I like to talk about it and I like to explain the steps because if somebody is where I initially was, I would actually encourage you to not wait because it won't get better. It's going to get worse and you're going to be in more pain if you wait. Um, at least that's what happened to me personally. So for progression, you know, downward progression of starting with the, oh, I hope somebody else maybe would take me out or essentially something would happen. And then it kind of progressed into more of the, you know, I should do something to myself. And it got to this stage where I was starting to not trust myself. And that's finally for me was the moment where I realized, oh, I can't even trust myself anymore. And that was a red flag for me, which I'm very fortunate about. Now, how old were you at this time when you finally hit that space? Yeah, I was 33. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's fortunate in some ways that you could weren't, you know, you're not much older than that now, I don't think, but I don't know. How, how many years ago was that, if you don't mind? So I'm 40 currently. So okay. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, but this is a, a progression from childhood from, you know, you probably came in with some maybe predisposition. I don't know. I don't know enough about that to know. Or is it, you know, is it driven by outside forces? Because, um, you know, so many, so many people, especially women do have anxiety and depression yeah. and sensitivity and all of those things. And then, you know, what comes first, right? What was the, um, yeah. So you saw, you saw that you were now thinking in a way that was really disturbing to you. Unfortunately, you were able to recognize that, mm -hmm. that this isn't where I want to be. What was your first step in taking taking what was your your first step I guess in um, trying to alleviate that yeah absolutely so you know fortunately for me I've always had my faith my spirituality mm -hmm. um you know I grew up in a more structured religious environment that for me did not really match with me full well so I kind of just went away from it for a while and then as an adult fortunately I started developing more of my own sense of spirituality mm -hmm. that for me just resonated more deeply and felt more correct and aligned with what I believe and who I am. And so I had luckily developed that foundation. And in the moment where I was feeling, you know, I had these thoughts that were very, uh, very overwhelming at what at the worst, they were just constant. It was kind of like, it was kind of like people were yelling at me and it was like bullhorns in your head, like saying, like, you need to do this, like really bad things, you know, to yourself. Wow. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, you know, I don't want to do this. Luckily, I knew that I didn't want to die. I just felt taken over by these dark voices in my head. And I really didn't know what to do. I felt completely lost. And the only thing I could think of in that moment was pray, 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 pray. Mm -hmm. So I literally was laying in bed, terrified. And was just crying and praying. And fortunately for me, the voice I heard, which I love the term, the God of my own understanding. I learned that from Alan. Mm -hmm. So the voice I heard, the God of my own understanding said, Lindsay, if you do this, you're coming right back because I'm not done with you. And I was like, what? <laughs> now, of course, what I had learned in my conventional religion says that that's not possible. Right. But, and I'm not here to have a religious debate of whatever at all, but I share what happened to me and what, what I heard, because that message for me saved my life. That message for me was, oh my gosh, well, that is literally the worst thing with how much pain I'm in. I can't imagine having to come back into this world and restarting and still being in this pain. So for me, that was like enough motivation. And also it was kind of like, for me, it was a spiritual truth. It was like, the dark voices are telling you that this is going to solve your problem, but that's not the truth. The truth is that, nope, you get right back. <laughs> um, so it's not a solution like you think it is. And so it just really woke me up. And I thought to myself, well, then there's no point. Why would I do that? There's no point in doing that. So that is what 
finally got me to realize I need to get more serious help. I mean, I had been in therapy previously, I actually started therapy when I was 19 years old for my anxiety. So I was used to therapy. I had been on medication previously. Now, this time I was not medicated, which I do believe was a part of why I went into this crisis mode. Um, but also just that over-encompassing anxiety was definitely a main part of it. So at, once I kind of realized I needed that help, I started like rapidly searching for where I could go and where what I could do. And to be honest with you, going to a mental health institution was absolutely last on my list. I had no desire to do that whatsoever. I was actually terrified of doing that. And it was so interesting what happened because all these other things I tried so desperately to get into were like, no, 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 closed door after closed door. And I got to the point where I was like, I don't have another choice. Mm -hmm. I have to go to the mental health institution. So that's where I went. And it was really interesting because walking in there, I was crying and I was terrified, but then there was also this weird sense of courage that came over me as I'm walking into the door because I realized I was facing my worst fear. So it's sort of like these thoughts that had told me that they, that they wanted me to no longer be here. They didn't win. I was winning because I was choosing myself and I was walking through that door. And so oddly enough, even though it was very painful and scary for me to do that, it was also very empowering. And that was sort of like, for me, the first important step that really helped me. Yeah. And I know in your article, you wrote about all the fears that you had around about going to a mental health institution. And it, it wasn't so much about, I don't know what they're going to do to me there. It was more about what are people going to think about me? What are people going to, you know, you had a husband, right? You still do. Mm -hmm. I will say yeah. you still do. Yeah. And you had a career. Yeah. And so you were thinking that all these things are now going to tank. All these relationships are going to just disappear because, was it because you thought people would see you as flawed, that they would just, yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I believe, and I don't, I would like to, I don't think I'm the only one that thinks this way. I think if you're a highly sensitive, anxious person, you worry about what other people think. Mm -hmm. And you also, your mind tells you, you can't tell anybody this because they're going to think that you're nuts. They're going to think that you're crazy. They're going to look at you differently. And I was so paralyzed. And because I had such a extreme lack of self-esteem, I was relying so heavily on other people to kind of validate me and tell me all these great things about myself. And I didn't even really believe it. I didn't feel it. I didn't believe it. And so that's why it was so easy for me to kind of fall into the trap of like, oh, I can't say anything because I can't change <clears throat> my whole persona based on, you know, if somebody finds out that I'm walking into this institution, oh my gosh, they're gonna be like, Lindsay's crazy. What is, what's wrong with her? Um, just all that judgment. But now that I know what I know, because I'm on the other side, I can look at it and realize that was me. I was judging myself. And it was just the constant self-judgment, self-criticism that was so heavy for me. And now it's like, you know, it's it really took me getting that low and, and going through that experience to even be able to talk about it openly because before that I could never talk about it openly. I would actually hide uh going to therapy. I would not tell anybody that I was going. I'm um, just because shame in myself. And now I talk very openly about it, but I also had several people on my journey that were talking about it openly. So as I was healing and as these people were helping me, I kind of realized, oh my gosh, they're really helping me. And I need to be open because maybe I can help somebody. So that's what really kind of helped me get more open about it. Yeah. And also, I mean, my generation, you know, didn't talk about mental health at all because our parents didn't. And I remember yeah. when I told my mother when I was in my Oh, gosh, I guess I was in my early 30s when I started therapy. And her response was, oh, all therapists do is blame everything on your mother. Yeah, <laughs> that was her. And she had this fear of what was I going to discover, I think. And, you know, and there was some good reason for that concern of hers, because there was a lot of stuff there. Um, right. I'm fortunate that, you know, I I started earlier and got some help, too, but it was never to the extent that you're talking about, but there are so many people who do just suffer in silence. And I think that, you know, you're talking about it now on the other side of it and being, you know, to think that you had low self-esteem, it's like, here you are, you know, I'm an author of six books and I'm, was it six or seven? I'm sorry. Six currently. Okay, 
six currently. Yeah. And I'm looking, there's going to be more to that. And it's like, yeah. that is somebody who really likes herself, loves herself and is proud of who she is. So thank you for being that example. Thank you. And you know, Lindsay, in your, in your article, you also shared four tips, if you will, but things that you discovered and used to help you through your recovery process. I'm going to have you share two of them with us, but I'm going to ask our, our viewers to go to magazine and read the other two because they're all four really excellent. The first one is develop a relationship with a higher power. You touched on that a little bit. What more do you want to say about that? Yeah, I would say the most important thing is the source of unconditional love. And this is actually something that I talk about in my writing to heal program that I facilitate. And what is so important about this is it has to be a source of unconditional love. So um, I recognize that, you know, some of us may believe in a certain higher power. Some of us may believe in another higher power. Some of us may not have a higher power. So I don't want people to feel limited if, if you're out there and you don't believe in a higher power. Just, I would highly encourage you to find someone or something that you believe is a source of unconditional love for you. And um, what I share for people is that, you know, it can be a person, it can be an animal. Yeah, you know, animals are great examples of unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And also if it is a person or animal, they don't have to be alive. They can be somebody that's already passed over. Uh, you know, so for instance, I was very close to my, uh, my grandmother on my dad's side. So I can often think about her and, you know, connect with her even though she's been in spirit for several, several years. And so that source of unconditional love is really pivotal because when you're in that space, you are not going to love yourself. I mean, I did not love myself. And so, you know, I would go to therapy sometimes or classes and people would be like, you should love yourself. And I'd be sitting there like, sure, you know, like, but I didn't feel it. It wasn't real for me. And I could just sit there and act like it all day. But I really teach people, you know, if you tap into that energy of someone or something that does love you, it really helps kind of get you to the point where you start to see yourself a little differently. But you kind of, if you expect yourself to start here, but it's just not there, it's like you're fighting a battle that you can never win because you don't have it in yourself. So I tell people, if you don't love yourself today, like don't force it, you know, if it's not genuine, but you can use that energy from the other person, other thing, and you can start to learn why you're so awesome and why you're so valuable. And then in seeing that and feeling that it kind of helps you get to that next stage. Like you can be like, okay, maybe I can like myself. That's a good goal. Instead of expecting yourself to jump from, you know, I hate myself to I love myself. That's a far jump. Yeah. So I like to treat, you know, teach people that you, there's steps that you can take in between, which for me is was more attainable. I didn't feel like going from, I hate myself, so I love myself was not something that I could do. It's, I think it's just so much psychobabble, you yeah. know, because it isn't, it, it's definitely a process mm -hmm. and it's not a straight line and it's not always forward. It goes like this and it, you know, and two steps forward, one step back sometimes. I think you're very wise to look at it from that perspective. And I also believe that, you know, when we're in that space, if we do have that person, especially if it's a person that we've had this relationship with now, you know, animals are great too, and they are so unconditional. But if we, if someone loves us and shows how much they love us, typically we will admire them and we will love them. So how can yeah. they be wrong about me, right? How right. can they be so wrong if I think so highly of them? If I can see myself reflected in their eyes, then that is a definite boost. And again, you know, it could be a grandmother who died when you were six, but you remember how she talked to you or how, you know, just the relationship that you had. So I think that's a really, really, really super point. So thanks for that. Thank you. And then the second one is advocate for your own needs because you went down a number of dead ends, didn't you? You said you kept getting doors slammed in your face or things that were offered to you and you started them, but then you realize eh, this isn't working for me. And I, what gave you the courage first to actually know that you had choices, that you actually had a voice in all this? Because a lot of people don't think they do. It's a doctor yeah. told you things, you know, you've got to go with it, right? Yeah, you're right. And to be honest with you, I don't even know what that was because at that point I had such low self-esteem. It's kind of amazing that I had that ability to still have that inner advocate working, you know, right. um, which I'm really grateful for that. But, you know, and, and one thing that I didn't talk about in the article, but I would love to talk about with advocating for your needs 
is how important it is with medication that there is gene testing available. Not everybody knows that. And where this becomes so pivotal is that prior to gene testing ever being offered to me, there was a specific medication that's pretty popular out there that I had at least two or three providers recommend to me at different points on my journey. Fortunately for me, I'm a very intuitive person and my intuition would scream no every single time that this was offered to me. Now, when I responded no to the providers, of course, they're looking at me puzzled, like, why are you saying no? And I couldn't even explain it. I was like, I don't want to take that. And that's all I knew. I didn't have any information. Now, years later, I finally met a psychiatrist who I was actually the one that I met um, right after my recovery, like during my period after I was in the mental health uh, facility. And I, I say I graduated. So when I graduated, <laughs> came out, I found this amazing psychiatrist. And she said to me, well, I do gene testing. And I was like, what? <laughs> That's a thing. And we did only medicine on my do not take column. Is that medicine? Wow. And so that was like a whole, you know, moment for me of awakening and realizing, oh my gosh. And it's not that when that medication was being recommended to me, nobody was trying to hurt very popular medication, but I share that as often as I can with people, because I think to myself, gosh, how lucky am I that I said no, and that I had the autonomy to, to, to trust my gut and my intuition, because when you're in that space, of course, you're feeling very vulnerable. You're questioning so many things about yourself. And it's important that if you have that strong gut reaction to something like a medication, you know, maybe it's worthwhile to take that gene testing. Uh, of course, it's completely normal to be afraid of medication. I was scared to death when I uh, got on my first medication. I was literally praying and, you know, freaking out and just talking to people about it and researching. And I was afraid that I wasn't even going to wake up in the morning because my I was so afraid of medication. Um, but I was able to get over that hump. I was I'm still on medication today, but I feel a lot better about it because of the gene testing. So I know that what I'm on is safe for me. So it just makes me feel a lot more comfortable taking it. Um, and it, you know, it can be potentially scary what can happen if you are on one that doesn't match with you. Um, so I do like to really share that as part of being an advocate for yourself. And also for me on this journey, I felt like I was going through a spiritual crisis, even though I had this great sense of faith, it just felt like all this, all these things were happening to me that I didn't understand. And of course, conventional therapy really doesn't address that. And when I asked, I, I just started asking, I was like, is there anybody spiritual that I can speak to? And at first I was told, no, there's nobody. And I'm thinking to myself, why? Why is there nobody? <laughs> okay. So I just kind of kept asking. And by asking, I got led to my current, she's still in my life, my spiritual director. She's been in my life for seven years and she's been amazing. And initially I was meeting with her very often because I really needed it. We were meeting in person, we were talking through things, and she was helping me rebuild myself back up from the ground. Mm -hmm. And it was so effective for me that literally my psychiatrist said to me, what are you doing? Because this is not medication. This is something else is going on wow. because of how quickly I was able to really kind of come back to life from when I initially met her. She said to me, how you can't do that in a few months on medication. What is What are you doing? <laughs> and I said, it's a spirituality. For me, it was so powerful. And I know that that may not be the case for everybody, but it's so important to know that you have options. You mm -hmm. can look around, you can advocate for yourself and you can find what it is that's going to work for you. So if you're an outdoors person, maybe you need to incorporate outdoor therapy. Maybe you need to find you know, somewhere to go and you can be in nature and maybe even work with somebody in that context or whatever it is that works for your personality. It's so important to find that and to personalize that journey and not just kind of follow, you know, I mean, therapy is great, but it, it may not be enough. You may need something else that really suits you. So that's at least what I found. Wow. Such important information. Thank you for sharing all of that. And you, sure. you reminded me, kind of triggered a memory, not that I've ever forgotten this, but, you know, I was married young. I was 20 when I got married the first time mm -hmm. and moved to Maryland into Baltimore. And um, I'd suffered from migraine in mm -hmm. um, high school. 
started, I started getting headaches when I was a little kid and there was just nobody, I don't think anybody ever took it really serious. It was just, but I would be debilitated sometimes for a couple of days. I never saw a doctor for it, even though I saw a doctor for everything else. Never, nobody ever talked to me about the migraine. And so they got worse when I moved here and, um, I was recommended to um, go to a, um, let's see, what was he? He was an internal medicine doctor, I believe it was. And I told him he wanted to know what was going on in my life. And I told him and he leaned back in his chair and he could have been chomping on a cigar even, you know, just from the, the, the vibe that I was getting. And he goes, and here's what he said. He was probably in his fifties. He goes, well, honey, I mean, look at your life. You just got married. You just moved uh, to a new place. You just got a new job. You're just stressed. I'm going to write you a prescription. And he wrote out this prescription. I took it. I left. I got in my car. I looked at the prescription and it was for Valium. Mm. And my mother had been given unlimited access to Valium when I was growing up. And I didn't know how much that had affected her until I was really getting married. And it kind of all came, you know, to, to, um, to life. Fortunately, she was able to uh, get off of them when they moved to another state and the doctor wouldn't give it to her and started weaning her, you know, off of it. But I, I'm 20 years old and this doctor wants to give me Valium because I'm nervous. That's what they used to call it. Oh, mm. you're, you're nervous. You're just, you know, I mean, I, I think anxiety is so, so much a better word. I don't know if they were causing the migraine or not. Um, typically, I, I mean, the way I really stopped having them is more was about food choices more than it was anything else. But I thought if I didn't have that knowledge, you know, I could have had some issues because it's a very easy drug to get addicted to. Oh, it's, absolutely. You know, and, you yeah. know, it's not, I mean, people took them, took them in college just to kind of feel better, you know, as uh, you could buy them, you could buy them from people in college, you know. And so, um, well, I'm going to tell you all the, the two other tips that, that Lindsay suggests. So you'll want to go read about it. Soak up positive voices, however, and whenever possible. And you give some examples and links to other things, uh, some things that you listen to, some things that you read that could be really helpful for anyone watching. And also don't willfully ingest toxins of any kind. And that is something that, well, a lot more now than in the earlier days, but it's not really top of the list for people to think about. When they're going mm -hmm. through a crisis like this, it's like, but well, what am I putting into my body and how is that affecting it? Um, and it doesn't have to be anything you're putting in your mouth. It could be things you're putting into your mind. Correct. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. It's spot on. It's, you know, and unfortunately we are living in the days where, you know, the negative seems to get more likes, more clicks, more shares. And it's hard. It's really hard to distance yourself but I would say, you know, don't be afraid to not watch the news. Don't be afraid to stay off of social media. If you need to just take that mental health break for yourself, if you're finding it really hard to not get inundated by that negative information that's out there, then you can take the appropriate space and set your personal boundaries to make sure that you're watching positive. I know, uh, you know, I talked about an article, but I was watching reruns of Island <laughs> because that's my therapy show. I love that show. I grew up with that show. So it's, it's a huge comfort for me. And I know that it's never going to be negative. It's always going to be funny and uplifting. So it's just safe. It's just a safe show. Um, so it's just one that I always go to if I'm feeling like I really need to pick me up. As a little funny aside here, that is so interesting. When I read that, I was laughing because I could not watch Lucy very much. I would always get so anxious for what she was going to trouble. I mean, I would sit there as a little kid and go, oh no, don't you remember when you tried that before and it didn't work? Oh, I, like, I was always like embarrassed for her that she was going to get found out yet again, you know, and sort of miss the comedy of it all. But yeah, so I guess everybody has to find their own, their own thing that speaks to them, right? Yes, exactly. Well, let me just uh, throw this in here. So if you're watching this live or the replay, Lindsay does share much more in her article. You can find that at OPW opwgc.com forward slash magazine. And that link is also in the text of this video. So Lindsay, how can our viewers find out more about you? Yeah, I would say follow me on social media. That's the best bet. I'm under Lindsay P. Writes on Facebook and Instagram. So that's where I'm the most active. So I always just share anything upcoming, uh, including the events that I'm doing or my upcoming books. And as we wrap this up, share a final thought with our viewers. You know, I just really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to speak on this. And 
if you would have told me, you know, when I was 19, hiding on my way to therapy, literally hiding, um, that I would be doing this, I would be like, absolutely not, you're insane. Um, but it just goes to show that the power of healing and the power of being positive. And I really hope that if anybody out there is struggling, that you find the courage in yourself to seek help because you are worth it. And the world needs your light. And in fact, one of my personal th theories that I developed during this time that really helped me was that, you know, the darkness attacks those that they see are light and see you as a threat. So if you're struggling with these thoughts, it's actually because you are a very powerful light being and the darkness is seeing you as a threat. So if you can find a way to power through this, um, remember that the world needs you very, very much. And we need you to be here. We need you to keep going. And you're just going to be amazed at what can happen in, in your life if you allow yourself to do that. Thank you. Beautiful last words here. And you're going to be writing some more for the magazine. So uh, oh, absolutely. Whatever, whatever else you have coming up. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your experience, your honesty, your vulnerability, all of those things that that is so needed in the world because, you know, we can walk around looking at other people. In fact, I read something many, many, many years ago. I actually found it in the desk drawer of a, of a job that I had just started. <clears throat> and somebody left this one little note in the desk drawer. Everything else had been taken out. And it said, we go around judging everyone's, our insides by everyone else's outsides. And mm -hmm. we never measure up. We're always short. And so because a lot of people are still walking around with masks on, and I'm not talking about the kind for COVID, I'm talking about the kind that we don't want people to see us. And so the more we can be real, the more we can, we can let other people know that we all suffer for, through something. Nobody is living in perfection. You know, our life is not, I'm glad you're on Instagram because so much of Instagram is about the beautiful things, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not life for anyone really. And so the more we can all be brave and out there and showing our flaws and showing our, our um, true selves without fear of being, well, we're still going to get judged. I mean, that's it. People are going to judge because people right. judge, you know, sometimes they judge us really well and sometimes they don't. And, mm -hmm. but the more we grow in that self-esteem piece, the less it matters. Yes, absolutely. Especially with somebody behind a computer on social media. I mean, duh, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you again. I really appreciate it, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I just you're love so the welcome. magazine. So I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. Okay. Well, I'm glad your contribution. So thanks. And I want to thank anyone who's watching the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show. For more information on the On Purpose Women Global Community and Magazine, please click on the links in this video. And be sure to check out Lindsay's um, social media sites as well to see what she's up to. I'm sure she shares much more wisdom on those posts as well. And for more interviews with amazing women living their lives on purpose, check out our YouTube channel, which is also in the text of this video. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to look kind of goofy here. There we go. 